Welcome to Frank Stiano Explains. Today's topic is going to be how to deal with essay style exam questions. In my experience, many of my students, even some of the best uh, technically strongest students, have a fear of essay style questions because they are never sure if they got it right. Uh, this is the type of people who like to perfect their preparation by trying out questions and seeing that they got exactly what uh, the solution notes said. Uh, and in the essay style question you can't really do that because the, the solution notes for the essay style question will give you some ideas, maybe you, you express some other ideas, and then uh, how do you know if the ideas you uh, put on paper uh, would get credited if they're not the same as the ones in the solution notes. And so this gives a feeling of uncertainty to the uh, student that makes them prefer things that have a definite correct answer and say, well, I can prepare for those. I don't know how to prepare for the essay style question. I'd rather stay away from them because it's just too fluffy, you know, the kind of stuff humanities people do. I want to, think that, to do things that are right, correct. And uh, so I stay away from uh, essay style questions. Now, this is all very well. Uh, but it is a uh, limited view of the world and uh, you have to realize that the way that you can be useful to someone and add value uh, if you have a customer, a client uh, and you want them to um, get your services then you have to have a broader view than just being able to answer the uh, solutions that have a unique correct answer so someone may come to you and ask your uh, advice about a real-world problem. Now, this, uh, my specialty is computer security, so we'll take an example from computer security. I run a um, security consultancy, as you may know, uh, and clients do come to me asking me uh, real-world questions about their the product they're about to launch, about uh, the security of their installation, of their website, of their network, uh, it could be their plant or factory or operations or, or whatever, or, or a meeting they're going to have. So in that sense, there isn't going to be a single correct numerical answer. There's going to be a variety of things to think about, and you have to uh, think about, help them think about things that they haven't thought about, and also help them assess uh, what makes sense. Because if they come to you and they ask, how can I make my item uh, impossible to hack, then uh, this is a, a fallacy that uh, security would make things impossible to hack. A very instructive exercise that we used to do in the engineering department at the University of Cambridge with first-year um, candidates was that we would ask them to build a bridge out of you know, uh, tubes made of rolled up newspaper uh, and that has, you know, the tubes have a certain strength so you can actually make yourself a bridge spanning you know, the two desks. Uh, and it'd make a bridge and uh, then we would see how strong the bridge was by just putting uh, stronger and stronger weights on it until it collapsed and you were scored on uh, how much weight your how much weight your bridge would uh, hold before it collapsed. Now obviously uh, no matter how solidly you build your bridge there will always be a weight that uh, will make it collapse and it's not because it's made of uh, rolled up paper it's because there will always be a weight even if it were made of um, steel and concrete uh, there will always be a weight that's large enough that makes it collapse and the same for any security system there is always going to be an attack uh, that is going to be able to defeat any measures that you put in and so how can I make this totally secure is clearly a naive question and one you shouldn't try to answer. Uh, the correct question to answer is um, what is it that's worth doing in order to make the system more secure than it is now? So let's take um, as an example a question that was set by my esteemed colleague uh, Dr. Kuhn as an exercise for the uh, second year security course what would a security analysis for your bicycle look like? 
What assets does your bicycle provide to you and what vulnerabilities and threats to you and others do they create? What other risks and requirements could you face as its owner and user? So security analysis for your bicycle is something that uh, very few people do uh, consciously, but you must have done it subconsciously when you went out and uh, bought a lock. So your bicycle is of some value to you. You'd be annoyed if you if it were stolen and therefore you bought uh, also a lock to secure it to something fixed when uh, you lived outside. And so how much uh, of a lock should you buy to protect your bicycle? Clearly that is uh, going to be a function of how valuable your bicycle is. If, uh, like me, you have a an old and battered bicycle. I, 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 for many years I rode a bicycle that I had bought uh, second hand off another student for just 10 pounds. So clearly I would not go and buy a 50 pound lock to secure that bicycle because the bicycle I don't pay 10 pounds for. Now this is not uh, exactly correct because if I were to replace that bicycle it would be difficult for me to find an equally good deal as the one I found that pound just buying a bicycle for 10 pounds. Maybe next time uh, I would only be able to find another cheap bicycle for 30 or 40 pounds but still um, so so the value of the value of the bicycle to me is actually more than 10 pounds I shouldn't lock myself to the fact that I got a good deal when I bought it. I should more think about the replacement cost but if the replacement cost is say 40 pounds then surely uh, it is pointless to buy a 50 pound lock now if the replacement value of my bicycle were 70 or 80 pounds would it be advantageous then to buy a 50 pound lock? Uh, to answer that question you have to uh, consider that the 50 pounds you pay for buying the lock you just pay them for sure 100% probability once you decide to buy the lock whereas the fact that your bicycle is stolen and you have to replace it with another one that may cost you 80 pounds uh, is not uh, guaranteed to happen maybe uh, you'll go for a whole week, a whole month, a whole year maybe two or three years before uh, this ever happens. So if it doesn't happen then uh, the possible loss of 80 pounds has to be weighed uh, with a probability which is less than one. In fact if it's a particularly rubbish bicycle then uh, few people would actually bother stealing it and so probability goes down even lower. And so the loss of 80 pounds is weighed uh, with let's say a 10% probability that the, the loss might happen and so uh, you should consider it worth only eight pounds as opposed to the certain cost of the 50 pound locks which means 50 pounds is multiplied by one in front of it 100 percent so you have to uh, say goodbye to 50 pounds uh, compared to perhaps saying goodbye to 80 pounds to a weighed value of maybe just eight pounds so in that case it's still not worth it uh, on the other hand if you are one of these bike nerds that ride an extremely expensive bicycle made of uh, carbon fiber and uh, unicorn tears and all that stuff which costs upwards of a thousand pounds then surely uh, the 50 pound lock uh, is a good investment and uh, maybe uh, you even want to buy uh, one for each wheel or something like that so uh, when you do a security analysis for your bicycle you have to uh, consider your asset what is it that you are securing how much is it worth to you how much is it worth to you uh, to replace if you lose it. Um, how much is it worth to the thief? That's also worth considering because the thief is uh, maybe assigning a different value to the asset than you are, uh, typically a lower one if it's just uh, the resale, but in some cases it could be, uh, it could be different. Uh, and uh, the value that the attacker puts on your asset uh, will influence how interested they are in uh, enacting the attack then you have to assess the likelihood uh, that the attack uh, will be attempted and also the likelihood that the attempted attack will actually succeed uh, which is a function of how vulnerable your asset is uh, which is a function of uh, a variety of things including not just which kind of lock you buy but also uh, where you usually park your bicycle is it just you know you're leaving it outside uh, the shop for the five minutes that you're inside uh, and after that you're always riding the bicycle or keeping it in your locked garage at home uh, or is it the case that uh, you leave the bicycle 
uh, outside your workplace for the whole day that you're at work or is it the case that you even uh, leave it outside overnight uh, and so all these things make it uh, or you, you leave it overnight uh, in places that you're not even uh, near where you're uh, spending the night all these things uh, uh, give a variety of probabilities for the likelihood that the attack will succeed if it is attempted. And then uh, you have to assess the cost of the various countermeasures that you could enact. The cost could be the monetary cost of having to pay for the 50 pound lock or for a more expensive 100 pound lock um, uh, or for a very cheap uh, one uh, and also the cost not just the monetary cost, but the cost of you know, the extra hassle of, uh, instead of locking it to a lamppost outside, uh, bringing it inside, you know, uh, shouldering the bicycle for uh, three flights of stairs so that you can keep it in your office so that uh, it's not left outside where people could uh, work on the lock unattended. So you assess all these costs and the cost of ferrying your bicycle uh, on your shoulder for three flights of stairs. You have to pay every day, every day you have to do that uh, to bring it in and so on. And how much does this add up to? Well, at some point you might decide, well, I'd rather than stealing the bicycle than me having to uh, carry it for three flights of stairs every day. So um, you add up all the certain costs of providing uh, the countermeasures and you balance that against uh, the uncertain costs with some probability assigned to the uncertainty of um, of the attack succeeding and then you find uh, an equilibrium you say well uh, if the sum of my costs exceed that then I shouldn't do that I should do some some countermeasures that uh, that are uh, less onerous for me but uh, to that level it's okay because it's less than what I would lose if the attack worked uh, and it's still tolerable for me and uh, it's worth me doing it. So that is the kind of uh, analysis you want to do. Basically, uh, the underlying truth is that security is risk management. And uh, if you if you can uh, give that type of wisdom to your client, then you're going to be worth a lot of money. My uh, security consultancy uh, has very happy clients who come back again and again because I can offer style of insights to them. It's not just about uh, the technical thing that has the correct answer uh, and you know the security, how how does this particular thing get hacked, how does this web server get secured and so on and so on. It's also the bigger vision of uh, which things are worth thinking about and to what extent should I go to the trouble of attempting to secure them and to what other extent should I instead say well if it happens it happens and I take it on the chain and move on because uh, it's um, less trouble for me to do that than to try to secure against every possible thing that could go wrong. So if we go back to the example of the bicycle, uh, so far we've only spoken about uh, possible theft of the bicycle and in the context of looking at the big picture uh, you should be thinking of uh, other things than just the theft of the bicycle. What other things, uh, what did the question say exactly? Um, what assets does your bicycle provide to you and what vulnerabilities and threats to you and others do they create? We never spoke about any threats to others. How could a bicycle create a threat to others? Well, uh, I could imagine running into someone with my bicycle and um, then causing injury or in uh, extreme cases even death by running them over. The, so something newspaper, some angry cyclist in London running someone over and then the person dying. And, trial and so on. So um, how could this be the result of uh, some attack, some malicious attack that causes uh, uh, the cyclist to inflict damages on a third party? Um, well maybe uh, the attacker wants to put the cyclist in trouble for some reason, you know, revenge or hate or whatever, uh, maybe even blackmail, and uh, they would sabotage the bicycle, for example, uh, sabotaging the brakes, so that at a crucial moment when the cyclist needs to do a hard uh, stop, then the brakes fail catastrophically and then 
the cyclist has an accident possibly involving other people and causing therefore a much more trouble for the cyclist if it was just you know, one month in hospital for the cyclist is a lot less bad than uh, a trial for having murdered a pedestrian by running them over. Um, minor, uh, I mean, less extreme forms of sabotage might take the form of um, putting ink or glue on the handlebars or other other things that just cause inconvenience to the cyclist. But all these things are things that the cyclist would have to take into account when deciding uh, where to park the bicycle, how long to leave it unattended for. Uh, and thereby exposing themselves to a uh, smaller or greater extent to those kinds of risks. Um, now, making a very uh, elaborate analysis like this may sound uh, ludicrous for a bicycle, but you should take this as a metaphor for all the other things that you could do uh, to do the security analysis of a new product that the company is launching or uh, the network of this company, uh, the website of this company, and so on and so forth. All the things that uh, a client of a security consultancy might legitimately uh, come forward and ask. Uh, and even if we speak specifically of a bicycle, there are more extreme cases than just uh, your bicycle or my bicycle. Uh, if you were uh, entertaining the thought of securing the bicycle of a VIP, which could be, you know, uh, a celebrity, singer, or actor worth hundreds of millions of dollars or head of state, uh, then uh, there could be uh, motivated attackers wanting to cause injury and damage to that VIP and it might not be uh, totally out of the question to consider what could happen if someone wanted to, uh, for example, assassinate the VIP by hiding a bomb or a poison spike or something uh, in, in the bicycle. And so you would have to take that into account as well and uh, then have an appropriate form policy for uh, reducing appropriately the risk that this might be enacted uh, while the bicycle is unattended. Maybe in extreme places you would never want to leave the bicycle unattended. Now I'm not that type of VIP. I have no concerns that people might want to assassinate me through a poison spike in my bicycle and therefore I do leave my bicycle unattended uh, outdoors. But if I were consulting for type of VIP I might uh, take uh, a different view and it would not sound um, overly paranoid if this were uh, a plausible risk based on uh, on history and, and on the profile or risk profile of that, of that person. Now um, if we continue just to uh, brainstorm about other things that uh, could go wrong with the bicycle uh, maybe uh, we are not just talking about uh, my own uh, safety, but other forms of security, uh, such as um, misbehavior in a racing competition. So in a uh, cycling competition, there would be uh, clearly uh, regulations to ensure that the race is fair. And so uh, the officers who are uh, arbitrating the, the race would have to take into their uh, security analysis, the possibility that some of the cyclists might cheat and hide some kind of electric motor inside the bicycle. And so the pre-race and post-race and random inspection uh, would have to include uh, checks for these things which nowadays can be made uh, fairly small and maybe hidden uh, within what looks like uh, an innocent uh, frame, especially given the strange frame shapes that the racing bicycles might sometimes have. And so how would you go about finding uh, an electric motor if it exists, uh, would X-ray be enough, uh, whatever. So all these things would have to be a part of uh, that uh, security analysis for the rest. Uh, if bicycles start having uh, electronics in them for, for example, um, a button on the handlebar that is electronically linked to a gear shifter, they're here instead of just uh, with a mechanical cable, then uh, how about hacking from um, an attacker against another cyclist? Um, maybe in the context of a race, maybe in the context of uh, vandalism and sabotage uh, by um, interfering with this communication and making it shift when it shouldn't or making it not shift when it should and so on. So uh, there we have um, 
electronic type of hacking uh, coming back into the realm of, of the bicycle and all these things uh, would also be in scope for some uh, cases of the security analysis. Now, uh, we have said uh, a lot of things about this, th this simple uh, exercise text uh, and if you saw these as the uh, the solution notes for the exam. If this were an exam question, it's not an exam question, it's just uh, a seed for discussion between uh, the student and the supervisor in, in, in preparation. Uh, but it is a good seed because it makes you think, okay, well, whatever it is that you thought, there's probably going to be more. Uh, and the student who's afraid of not having said all the things that might have been in the list uh, should no longer be afraid. Uh, should, first of all, uh, broaden their mind to the fact that there's always more things that you could think of uh, and also be reassured that the person marking this exam question, if it were an exam question, is not going to be uh, ticking boxes for, oh, have they also mentioned the poison spike? Have they also mentioned uh, how expensive the, um, the U-lock should be? And so on and so on. It's not the way that we assess something. We would assess, I would assess a question like this by saying, well, is this person thinking in a uh, principled way, a holistic way, about security? Can they say something that if I were their client I would want to pay them money for and go there a second time for more advice on, on another thing? Uh, or are they just kind of rattling things off that they memorized uh, without really uh, a feeling for what's important uh, and what one should be looking at? Um, it's perfectly fine not to mention uh, a big subset of the things we said, so long as you have a coherent argument about uh, what uh, one should be looking for during this uh, security analysis of this bicycle. Uh, and um, it is not a, an exercise in uh, having covered all possible eventualities, but in, in having thought, uh, having thought hard enough that you demonstrate an understanding of the way to approach this are another problem. And uh, you should first of all demystify security questions in the sense that even if you don't get the same things that were in the solution notes, even if you say something different that the solution notes didn't say, if it's meaningful uh, it could very well be that the examiner thinks, ah, that's a smart thing, uh, I'm glad that this person, this candidate thought of that and give you a good mark. Um, and uh, the best way I see to think of these um, exam questions uh, in essay style is that if this essay were your answer to your client, would the client pay you a thousand pound an hour? Would the client come back for more next week because what you gave them in the first hour last week was actually very valuable and they want uh, to open their wallet again to pay you again for that. Uh, and that is the proof that your uh, your essay was worth listening to, even if you didn't say the same things as in the exam question. So, um, exam questions with essays can be harder to prepare for, but they are, they can also be a more mature form of expressing the, the knowledge that you built up by uh, studying the course and uh, attending the computer science trials. So when you are in, in a professional setting then uh, you will not be able to command uh, very high prices for your time if all you can do is give the exact unique answer to the numerical exercise. You have to also be able to uh, solve a problem uh, where the answer is not predetermined and find the best thing that your client can do uh, for them with your expertise. And at, at that point you will be adding value and you will be rewarded for that. So uh, take essay questions as a preparation towards that.